I'd now like to introduce Mr. Seb Cox, head of the historical branch, who will be talking about exercise Thunderbolt objective assessment of the bomber offensive with the air staff view of history. Good. Hopefully you can all hear me. Good afternoon. Uh, perhaps I should start by explaining for the benefit of those who've never heard of it exactly what the origin, scope and intent of Exercise Thunderbolt was. It took place over uh, three days in the summer of 1947 at the RAF School of Air Support at Old Sarum in the heart of Wiltshire. There's a nice irony here since the purpose of the exercise was to analyze the conduct of the strategic air offensive against Germany yet it was conducted at the RAF school specifically direct dedicated to the direct support of the army, which was itself, of course, not far from the great army training area on Salisbury Plain. It was chaired by the chief of the air staff, Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Lord Tedder, and the participants included a high proportion of the ser serving senior officers in the RAF, together with officers from the Royal Navy, the British Army, and the United States Navy, Army, and Air Forces, and Commonwealth Air Forces, as well as politicians and some senior scientific defense advisors. I shall return briefly to the participants later in this lecture. The late Professor Vincent Orange, in his excellent biography of Marshal Tedder, credits him with deciding to mount the exercise. In fact, however, the idea originated with Sir John Slesser, Tedder's successor as CAS, but at the time the Air Member for Personnel. Slesser had attended a similar high-level conference run by the British Army at Camberley and was sufficiently impressed to suggest to Tedder that the Royal Air Force should run a similar exercise of its own. Slesser raised the idea in August 1946 and suggested that the subject should be, quote, the real thing which creates air superiority, the unseen campaign by the bombers, unquote, which was itself an interesting perspective to say the least. Tedder accepted the suggestion and the focus, focus on the strategic air campaign. The exercise was a full year in the making and was to run over the three days in August 1947. The exercise took the form of 23 separate presentations, including the opening and closing addresses by Tedder. Some were formal lectures and some were short playlets simulating wartime meetings. Each was followed by a lengthy discussion period with the discussions themselves seeded in advance by officers briefed to raise certain issues. The discussions were recorded by shorthand note takers and the whole of the proceedings, including a precy of the discussions, were then published in three hardbound volumes for distribution to participants and other selected individuals, including the Prime Minister. The stated of the aim of the exercise was to consider, quote, the direction and development of the air offensive from the Casablanca conference in January 1943 to the end of the war, unquote. In his opening address, Tedder stated that he had been asked several times why he thought it worthwhile studying the offensive when he himself had forcibly stated that, quote, the last war is out of date, unquote. His answer to the question was to concede that technically and tac tactically that was true, but he referred back to the First World War and the vision of two great men, Smuts and Trenchard, and their use of their experience of that war to see into the future. He told his audience that they should not, quote, be mesmerized by bugs and atoms, which he characterized as being weapons, not warfare as a whole. He said that new gases, the atom and bugs, may affect the tactics of air warfare, perhaps in a revolutionary way, but they did not affect its principles, and it was the principles which he intended the exercise to examine. The exercise did not entirely ignore the future impact of atomic and biological weapons, jet aircraft, or other developments. At the end of the exercise, two presentations were included on aircraft and armament developments, and the effect of future scientific and technical developments on air strategy, the latter given by Sir Henry Tizard. Unfortunately, we do not know the content of these latter presentations or of the discussions which followed. These items were included in volume three of the proceedings, which was produced as a secret document. 
We know it was printed and distributed, but all copies were subsequently recalled and apparently destroyed for reasons we can only guess at. So, other than the mysterious and elusive projection into the future, what did the exercise consider? It took the form, as I have indicated, either of vignettes of wartime meetings and conferences or lectures on aspects of the air war. These started with assessing the Allied and ex Axis positions just prior to the Casablanca conference and moved through considerations of the strategic offensive from Casablanca to April 44, the arguments immediately prior to Overlord, the transportation campaign, and the campaign at large from April 44 to the end of the war, including a vignette of meetings of the Combined Strategic Targets Committee. I think it is important and instructive to examine in a little more detail both the individuals who attended the conference and especially those of senior rank who were selected to deliver the core lectures. All the 150 or so attendees were either serving officers, mostly of senior rank, or senior civilian scientific advisors still holding government posts. Those attending who gave lectures included Sir Norman Bottomley, who gave two presentations on the course of the bomber offensive and who had been deputy chief of air staff for most of the war and had been responsible for writing and signing a number of the air staff directives issued to Bomber Command during that war. Sir James Robb, who gave the presentation on the course of the air war, had been deputy chief of staff air under Eisenhower and Tedder at Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. Air Vice Marshal uh, Kingston McCluffrey had been chair of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force Bombing Committee prior to Overlord, and along with Professor Zuckerman, one of the architects of the Overlord Transportation Plan. Group Captain Sidney Bufton had been the Deputy Director and then Director of Bomber Operations on the Air Staff for much of the war, and drafted many of the letters which Sir Charles Portal exchanged with Sir Arthur Harris in their infamous correspondence over the winter of 1944-45. Bufton, who held the wartime rank of Air Commodore, had co-chaired the Combined Strategic Targets Committee in 44-45. The only presentation given by an officer who had served in a senior position in Bomber Command during the war, during Sir Arthur Harris's tenure as CNC, was Air Vice Marshal Arthur Sanders. Sanders, however, had not held an operational post but had been officer in charge of administration and his presentation related to the administra administrative and not the operational aspects of the bomber, bomber offensive. That is to say, the expansion of bomber command, including training, aircraft and squadrons, airfields, manpower aspects, etc. Thus, the presentations on air aspects in the exercise were all given either by officers who had held important posts related to the bomber offensive on the air staff or important posts in Chafe or the Allied Expeditionary Air Force. None were given by senior officers who had held posts in bomber command in the later war period. The attendees included most of the serving officers of the RAF above the rank of Air Vice Marshal. Of these, however, only three had served as bomber group commanders under Sir Arthur Harris. Air Chief Marshal Sir Ralph Cochrane had famously commanded Number 5 Group under Harris. Air Vice Marshal Addison had been AOC of the 100 Group Specialist Electronic Countermeasures Group. Hugh Constantine had replaced Cochrane late in the war as AOC of 5 Group in January 45 with the acting rank of Air Vice Marshal. He had, however, reverted to his substantive rank of Group Captain at the end of the war and attended the exercise as a Group Captain. Air Marshal Sir Hugh Wormsley had been Senior Air Staff Officer Night Bombing at High Wycombe from mid-1944 to the end of the war. Sam Eldworthy had served as Group Captain Operations at HQ Bomber Command and then as a Senior Air Staff Officer as an Acting Air Commodore at Number 5 Group. He too had reverted to his substantive rank and attended as a Group Captain. The two substantive group captains were thus seated right at the back of the conference hall. Only Cochrane and Wormsley, by dint of their rank, were seated near the front, and only Cochrane was given a formal role in the proceedings, being asked not to give a lecture, but to kick off the discussion periods on the two items relating to the course of the bomber offensive. 
The only other officer present who had served under Harris at Bomber Command was Air Marshal Eric Curriton, who had commanded Five Group, but whom Harris had fired. Other than Cochrane, none of the individuals named who served with Harris made any contribution to the, to the discussions, except for one very brief comment from Wormsley. A brief comment on the civilians present also seems apposite. Sir Henry Tizard was still the chairman of a Defence Scientific Advisory Committee. Dr Dickens had been head of Harris's operational research section during the war and still held a senior scientific post in defence. Other civilians present held either scientific or intelligence posts. Other than Tizard, however, the most prominent civilian present and the one who made the most contributions in discussion was Professor Solly Zuckerman. Zuckerman had, of course, worked closely with Tedder from 1943 onwards, had been the principal architect of the Overlord Transportation Plan in 1944, and had subsequently led the British Bombing Survey Unit in the immediate post-war period. By August of 47, however, he held no formal position or advisory role in defence, though he was the deputy chairman of a wider government advisory committee on science. He was thus the only person present who was not part of the formal defence establishment or a senior representative from another nation. In that sense, his presence was perhaps somewhat anomalous however justified it might have been in respect of his wartime and immediate post-war roles. COVID has prevented me from consulting Zuckerman's papers at the University of East Anglia, but I have little doubt that his presence was at the express invitation of Tedder. In fact, according to the late Professor Orange, the participants had been provided with copies of the British Bombing Survey Unit's reports prior to the exercise. And Orange quotes a conversation with Zuckerman in which he stated that Tedder had told Zuckerman that he had named the exercise Thunderbolt because, quote, he wanted it to hit everyone right between the eyes, unquote. It's not possible in the time available to me today for me to discuss each of the presentations made during the exercise, so we will perforce have to concentrate on a few of the more interesting ones. Item six of the conference purported to show a discussion of service joint planners, Navy, Army and Air Force, prior to the Casablanca Conference of 43, regarding a draft of what became the famous Casablanca Directive for the conduct of the combined bomber offensive. The presentation essentially followed through the arguments on the strategic intent of the offensive and its place in Allied strategy. It sketched out the Navy's concerns that lack of long-range aircraft was compromising the effort to close the so-called Mid-Atlantic Gap, along with their desire to see Biscay U-boat bases targeted, and the Army's concerns that too great a concentration on the strategic offensive would see inadequate resources devoted to Army support. In the subsequent discussion, led by a Vice Admiral, the old arguments regarding the Atlantic being a necessary but strategically defensive battle to which a necessary but irreducible minimum of resource should be devoted were rehearsed once more. The airmen present were at pains to point out that diversions of anything but very long-range aircraft, i.e. B-24 Liberators, were in fact of little value in the battle as they were not suitably equipped and the crews not trained. Nevertheless, as Sir, Arthur, uh, sorry, Sir Norman Bottomley pointed out, of 19 squadrons all allocated to Bomber Command in 1943, some went to India and 11 to Coastal Command. Tedder himself stated his belief that the only direct effect of further diversions from Bomber Command would have been to delay the achievement of air superiority, which alone made D-Day possible. When Air Marshal Baker, a former wartime director of Bomber Ops himself on the Air Staff, stated that it was not just the loss of aircraft to Bomber Command, but the development of Bomber Command's operational techniques, which was being defeated by the diversions to Coastal Command, because they required a different technique, Steder, Tedder stated that when planning had not been sound and emergency measures such as this had to be implemented, the measures themselves were, quote, seldom good ones. There followed a lengthy debate on the Casablanca Directive. This revolved around the question of whether the directive was too broad in scope when it had to be balanced against not only competing military objectives but potentially competing national ones as well. 
Sir John Slessor, who had been one of those who drafted the original directive, pointed out in this regard that what he termed, quote, the much criticized directive, unquote, was the first to define an agreed combined offensive signed off by both the UK and US chiefs of staff. He also pointed out that it established a set of priorities. He stated that, quote, the milk in the coconut, unquote, was the first six lines, which was the initial statement laying down that the offensive was intended to undermine the German military, industrial and economic system and civilian morale. He characterized all the stuff that goes in at the bottom as being the sort of stuff that had to be included to get international agreement on something important. Slessor was quite right to refer to the criticism aimed at the Casablanca Directive, criticism which continues to this day. But as the official British historians pointed out, the directive did not seek to reconcile the differing perspectives, but, quote, it simply accepted them all, unquote. Indeed, the directive did include pretty much everything. U-boat construction, the aircraft industry, transportation, oil plants, other war industry, plus Biscay U-boat bases, the German fleet, Berlin, and Italy. In the discussion, Solly Zuckerman opined that in January 43, the Allies simply had insufficient knowledge to produce an, a realistic order of priority for the different target systems mentioned in the directive. Teda stated in response to a suggestion that in future only one target system should be designated, that he thought if resources were limited, which he expected they would be, then, quote, we should have to be much more hard-hearted about compromise, unquote. I find this statement surprising in someone as politically astute as Teda. As the official historians pointed out, the conflicts between the services, never mind between the two nations, were, quote, not easily adjusted at the high level of an inter-allied conference, unquote. And that if a solution had, quote, been too vigorously pursued, the conference would have failed to produce any bombing directive at all, unquote. In any future war, there was no reason to suppose that the international and inter-service dimensions were likely to be any easier than they were in 43. Some believed that the directive should not have been passed down to the commanders beyond the chiefs of staff. Teda questioned whether the directive had been too broad and liable to be used by commanders as an aim, when under the initial aim, one could literally do anything. This, of course, was a fairly obvious dig at Sir Arthur Harris. It is not, however, entirely fair, because Harris could, with justice, state that he was following the directive. And if the directive was not intended to set out the aim he was to strive for, then what was it for? The official historians have pointed out that Harris took it as his mandate for the Battle of the Ruhr, but that that was, quote, not an unreasonable interpretation, unquote. Others present at Thunderbolt disagreed with the CAS, including both Bottomley and Sidney Button, both of whom, of course, had a hand in writing and distributing the directives and subsequent ones to the operational commanders. All pointed to the fact that it laid down that the Allies were to proceed with a combined offensive and that it was to put Germany and not Japan first. Bufton referred to the tendency to pull Bomber Command, quote, in all sorts of directions, unquote. Bottomley pointed out that Portal was designated under the directive as the agent for the combined chiefs in controlling it. He reiterated this point in the following lecture, which he gave and which considered the course of the offensive up to April 44. Bottomley correctly predicted that the question of area versus precision bombing would become one of the most controversial aspects of air warfare, especially in view of atomic weapons. Doesn't need atomic weapons to make it controversial, I would point out. He pointed to the fact that 46% of Bomber Command's wartime effort had been directed at cities, but said that, except in a few instances, the US effort was concentrated on specific targets. Presumably, the latter reference was to Operation Clarion, a US attempt in 1945 to hit towns throughout Germany to influence German morale. Recent scholarship has exposed the fact that some 52% of the 8th Air Force's bombing was aimed non-visually, 
And although largely deliberately defined by them as directed at transportation targets, was in effect area bombing. Bottomley referred to the views of the NCNC Bomber Command. Interestingly, Harris is never referred to by name throughout Exercise Thunderbolt. Uh, Harris, sorry, Bottomley referred to the views uh, of Harris regarding the strategic e efficacy of air attack as expressed in his dispatch and Harris's recent book. He then referred by name to General Hap Arnold's view that, quote, indiscriminate widespread destruction is a waste of effort, unquote. Having pointedly contrasted the two approaches, Bottomley asked which view was correct and then dodged the answer to his own question by stating that it would have to await the examination of the facts. He then referred to the recently published US bombing survey, but oddly indicated that the British survey was not yet complete, which was very odd since it was complete. And of course, both surveys were in theory intended to establish the facts, which he appeared to think still needed to be established. Bottomley did refer to the fact that some 900,000 personnel were deployed in the AA defences of the Reich by 1944, and he did refer to the weapons they deployed pointing skywards and to the already substantial realignment of the Luftwaffe, both in terms of deployment to defending the Reich and in terms of the switch of industrial production to fighters, which was eventually to produce a Luftwaffe almost entirely oriented to the defence. He only made passing reference to the fact that area bombing forced the Germans to disperse their industry, which was sub subsequently to make it much more vulnerable to the attack on tra transportation later in the war. Air Marshal Cochrane kicked off the discussion period with a disquisition on accuracy, which was dependent on both techniques and training, and that the crucial factor was not gross tonnage, but the net number of bombs per acre in the target area. Zuckerman stated that is irrespective of the technical reasons for adopting area bombing, the idea that towns were the best target grew from the experience of the Blitz, but that this resulted in armament research being directed towards incendiary weapons and not weapons which would assist precision. This seems an odd argument to make. The standard four pound British incendiary was not a complicated weapon. Other large incendiaries were de developed, as were cluster incendiary munitions, but these can hardly be said to have significantly distorted armament research. Considerable efforts were made, successfully, to develop bigger and better bombs from the outset. Zuckerman also stated that area bombing only reduced, sorry, bottomly also stated that area bombing only reduced German production by some 10%. Bufton argued, Director of Bomber, Bomber Operations, remember, that the Pathfinder technique could have been developed earlier and could have been directed to precision and not area attack, but that the predisposition to area attack meant that subsequent development was directed to improving that technique and not precision. Cochrane, whose own group had developed many of the precision marking and attack techniques used at the end of the war, disagreed. He stated it was wrong to suppose that area attacks did not require precision, which was essential for good target marking and economy of effort in area attack. Bufton, of course, was the principal driver behind the Pathfinder force, an initiative initially resisted by Harris. But aside from the time factor, there is little to suggest that greater precision could have been achieved over Germany at a much earlier stage of the war. Tizard focused on the fundamental strategic issue of whether the strategy of avoiding direct defeat of the enemy forces in the field by destroying his sinews of war had failed. He did correctly identify the US long range fighters as the agent of air superiority, but questioned whether night bombing was of any value until precision became possible late in the war. Here too, though correct in his assessment of the US achievement regarding air superiority, he surely underestimated both the military and economic effects of area attack, perhaps influenced by the bombing surveys. The next significant presentation was given by Kingston McCluffrey and related to the Overlord Transportation Plan. The presentation pointed to the pre-Overlord arguments as to whether oil or transportation were the best target system to assist the assault. 
and there was some reference in the presentation and the subsequent discussion to the army preference for an interdiction plan as opposed to a transportation plan. That is to say, a plan largely focused on primarily the bridges over the Loire and the Seine. As Zuckerman pointed out in the subsequent discussion, there was actually no logical distinction between the two. A view endorsed by Tedder, who stated, accurately enough, that the alleged conflict between the interdiction and transportation plans was false. They were not conflicting, nor were they alternative, but complementary, which, of course, they were. Bufton admitted that he had opposed the transportation plan, but claimed that the Americans and sections of the air staff, by which he presumably meant his director of bomber operations, had always intended that the oil plan and the interdiction plan would run simultaneously. An unconvincing play, claim, and anyway, that would not have contributed to the Fortitude Deception Plan. The final two sessions of which we have a record were devoted uh, principally to the air war from April 44 onwards and also uh, to a, a presentation purporting to be uh, a meeting of the Combined Strategic Targets Committee. Uh, Bottomley, who gave the, uh, the overall presentation on the bomber offensive, did identify the oil and tran German transportation campaigns as being the decisive element in the undermining of German capacity. He also referenced transportation campaign and its effect on paralyzing rail and waterborne traffic, and in particular the virtual secession of hard coal exports from the war. He was at pains to quote a lecture given by Tedder, his boss, stating that the oil and transportation plans were common, common denominator systems. He did not, however, expose the attempts extent to which some expo uh, opposed the transportation plan, nor did he expose the dispute between Harris and Portal over oil. He did not identify the part played by area bombing in causing the dispersal of industry and the manner in which this re re rendered it more vulnerable to the transportation offensive. The final vignette of a combined strategic target committee meeting supposedly in November 1945 likewise did not expose the disputes, particularly over transportation, which took place in the genuine committee. The audience was shown the communications plan of the 7th of November 1944, but were never told that the plan was twice modified to concentrate attacks on isolating the Aurora in 45, and that this met with considerable opposition from many on the Strategic Targets Committee, including Bufton himself. Bottomley did not make mention of Bomber Command's late war successes against the U-boat. The CSTC simulation spent much time discussing the best way to counter the new and formidable Type 21 and 23 U-boats and considered five target systems for bombing which might have done that, but never referred to the Bomber Command effort which mined the Baltic effectively paralyzed U-boat training and meant that just one, one of the hundred or so Type 21 boats built and delivered ever entered operational service. Towards the very end of the discussions, uh, Air Commodore Pelly, who was the senior RAF officer on the British Bombing Survey, stated his belief that the German Army's fuel star starvation had been caused by transportation difficulties. This, of course, reflected the conclusion of the overall report of the British survey written by Zuckerman, which referred to the overriding importance of the offensive against communications. The BBSU report claimed that German efforts at repair of oil after the initial success successful attacks would subsequently have been sufficient to buffer the effects over the winter of 44-45 if transportation attacks had not defeated Speer and Gielenberg's repair effort. The oil, uh, these claims are stretching a point to say the least. The oil offensive destroyed Germany's productive capacity and Gielenberg could not have repaired the sites any quicker. The influence of Zuckerman and the BBSU, which as I have suggested, permeated the entire proceedings, is very clear here. In his closing address, Tedder took as his theme the need for economy. He quoted Mahan, not on the need to defeat the enemy armed forces, but rather to the effect that no democracy was likely to devote much effort to preparing for war. Indeed, he stated that Europe needed to devote its resources to, quote, something productive. His leitmotif of economy he applied not simply to spending, but called for economy through quality, not quantity, 
economy through flexibility and mobility, and economy through good intelligence and target selection. Although the conference had rightly stressed the impact of good and bad intelligence throughout, it did not really address the issue of the different agencies interpreting the same intelligence to suit their particular viewpoint. Whether it was the combined strategic targets committee focusing on oil or SHAFE focusing on transportation. I come back to the point that the exercise was heavily influenced by the air staff and SHAFE perspectives. Perhaps in, in uh, once one more sense, by, in one sense, more by the latter, even given the reliance on the BBSU and the presence of TEDA as CAS. More attention was devoted to communications than to oil. We have seen that even bottomly, an air staff man made sure he quoted CAS's views on the offensive. He was right, however, when he stated that area bombing versus precision would become of the most controversial one become one of the most controversial areas and it remains so to this day. The two most significant, indeed monumental, recent studies of bombing in the German economy by Adam Tooze and Richard Overy reached diametrically opposed conclusions on area bombing. I personally lean towards the former, and indeed I think Richard's earlier work was more positive than his book on the bombing war. What I think is incontrovertible is that leaving aside the economic effects of area bombing, Exercise Thunderbolt seriously underplayed its significant distorting effects, military effects, on German strategy. Thank you very much.